might be permissible to enslave somebody if making everybody else happier compensates for their unhappiness. I'm expecting you to say, that doesn't seem right. That doesn't seem like what morality requires. This is a problem with utilitarianism as a moral theory. That's what I'm trying to elicit from you. That's why I'm presenting this as a criticism of utilitarianism. OK. But there's one more point, important point here that I want to make. And that is that I said before that there are utilitarian philosophers these days, many of them. And when critics of utilitarianism trot out a slavery example, they cry, this is not fair. And the kind of, the kind of thing that utilitarians say about the kind of example I just gave is this. They say, yes, in theory, in principle, maybe the enslavement of some made unhappy would be compensated for by the vast increase in happiness by the majority. Maybe in theory you could, but in actual practice, they say, defendants of utilitarianism say, in actual practice, if you look at the way slaveholding societies work, <coughs> and you look at actual human psychology about how unhappy people would be, how happy they would be, if you look at a realistic human psychology and a realistic sociology of slavery, in fact, slave societies would not maximize overall utility. So the kind of toy example I just gave is just as unrealistic as making one person be at 10,000 and 99 of one. And there aren't real institutions that would produce that kind of result. Okay, so that's the kind of defense that a utilitarian would give. That things wouldn't actually, in fact, work out the way I just presented. So what you're saying with C, how there couldn't be one person who's at 10,000 and everyone else is one. Like, yeah, I was thinking, like, what about, I don't know, like some backwards country in like the Middle East or like some war torn country in Africa <coughs> war wars, would you say like the guy in charge? Really? You think he's going to be, I mean, I mean that happy? Oh, okay. That secure? Well, I, I mean remember the, the other cases were, you know, ten or twelve, maybe up to a hundred. So you think that guy's going to be a thousand times happier? Yeah, the only other thing I could think was that maybe like not everyone's a one dude go through like twelve and fifteen spider around. Okay. So you can see that the charge that these are unrealistic numbers really has some bite, <clears throat> whatever the details. And so a utilitarian would say that in fact, when we make uh, realistic numbers and make these trade-offs and balancing, uh, it's not going to come out that way. It's not going to come out in the end of slavery. Is that clear? Okay. But this just raises another objection, and this is the really important one for us. Um, so I think that actually that might be right, that defense of utilitarianism. Um, I'm not so confident as utilitarians are, but maybe it's right. But it really raises another one. And that is this. When we think about what's wrong with slavery, when we think about what's immoral about why we think morality condemns it. We think that slavery is wrong. I'm, I'm suggesting that I think this, and I'm suggesting maybe you'll think this also. That what's wrong with slavery is something or other that's a moral problem with it, regardless of how these numbers work out. That it just doesn't matter how happy or unhappy <coughs> the slaves are compared to the slave owners. It just doesn't matter how those numbers work out. We might say that the wrongness of slavery, the wrongness of enslaving somebody, is not compensated for in any way by someone else's increased happiness. So what utilitarianism says is that in order to figure out whether slavery is okay, 
We have to measure how unhappy the slaves are, measure how happy everybody else in the society is, and weigh that one against the other. And the defense that we were just talking about says, well, on a realistic weighing of those, it'll turn out that the slaves are made more unhappy than everybody else is made happy. And I'm willing to concede that. But I'm not willing to concede that that's what makes slavery wrong. So it seems to me that what we want to say, what I want to say at least, is that <coughs> slavery, the wrongness of slavery does not depend at all on how happy or how many slave owners there are. It's not made, put it this way, it's not made, slavery is not made any less bad if we imagine the slave owners being more happy. That kind of weighing of one against the other is irrelevant to my judgment, at least, that slavery is wrong. So, this objection to utilitarianism says that there's a problem here from the start in, in making this kind of trade-off. That what's missing here is something about uh, the fundamental immorality of state slavery that's not captured simply by the level of happiness of different individuals. Level of and one way to think about this kind of objection, a, a slightly different way of thinking about it, maybe is to say something like this. What's going wrong is the starting point. What's going wrong here is starting with merely subjective desires, merely subjective goals, and then finding a way of aggregating them and maximizing because, here's the objection, some of those desires, some of those subjective desires, really are not good. Some of those subjective desires that we started with really don't make the, the ends that they're for good. So, think about a slightly different example. Think about um, whether utilitarianism would say it's a good or a bad thing um, for, let's say, to allow a racist to beat up a victim. Okay. So, for a utilitarian, a racist has a desire to beat up a victim, and so allowing the racist to beat up the victim would increase the satisfaction of his desire. Presumably, the victim has a desire not to be beaten up. So allowing the racist to beat up his victim would increase his <coughs> level of satisfaction, decrease the level of satisfaction of his victim, and we have to trade off those. How happy will the racist be? How unhappy will his victim be? And of course, there are going to be other people may be affected, uh, so we need to count all of them in. But, but there's something gone wrong here in making this balance in the first place. The, the desire that the racist has to beat up his victim shouldn't count as a good thing at all. We don't think, I mean, this is similar to what I just said about the slavery case. We don't think that if the racist is really motivated, and is really racist, has a really strong desire to beat somebody up, we don't think that that makes it better. We might even think that makes it worse. And a utilitarian is not in a position to say that that desire is any different than any other desire. Utilitarianism Utilitarian is going to say that, that, de that the satisfaction of that desire is a positive good, hopefully 
outweighed by competing desires, and so it would not be satisfied, but counts it as a positive good. Yeah. Um, okay, if you make an appeal to human psychology and just say that any human that has a desire to cause harm or get satisfaction from harming others, is never, that desire, the present desire, is never going to cause utility. And satisfying it may make him. It, no, no. It, go it, may, it very well, if it's a desire, it very well may produce utility. What the utilitarian is going to say is that that positive good will be outweighed by more negative elsewhere. But you would also say that nurturing a desire is not in. Would not foster his future utility. It's bad for the person's overall well-being. Well, maybe. I mean, that depends on the situation that they're in. Now. Right. So maybe what what a utilitarian could say is that we shouldn't encourage those desires because encouraging those desires will lead to a lower overall level of satisfaction. That, that may be true. Nonetheless, it's still true that the utilitarian is going to count that desire, the satisfaction of that desire, as a positive good. Once again, hopefully to be outweighed by costs elsewhere. But this is now the criticism that I want to present, which is that it doesn't seem like that satisfaction of that desire is in fact a positive good. It seems like we want to say that there's something immoral about that desire itself. And the immorality of that desire itself means that its satisfaction shouldn't count as a positive good at all. Whether outweighed by competing goods or not, it's not a positive thing. It's not a good thing. Now this thought that we have to make a moral evaluation of our desires before we decide whether their satisfaction is good or not. Should I say that one more time? So the objection that I'm just raising here says that not all of our, not all of our desires, in fact, are good to be satisfied. It's not good. It's not true that for all of our desires, it's good that they be satisfied. Some are immoral. Some should not be, some should not be satisfied, whether there are competing desires, however the weights go, however many people that are affected, however intense they are. Some are just wrong. Some are immoral. So this thought that what we need to do is to make a moral assessment of our desires before we determine whether they're good or not. This upsets the whole structure. Because you remember, the important point about utilitarianism was that it starts by identifying what's good, satisfaction of desire, and then says morality is concerned with maximizing that. So morality doesn't come on the scene until after we've identified what's good, according to utilitarianism. According to utilitarianism, we start with a, you might say, a pre-moral or an amoral account of value. Whatever people happen to desire. No moral assessment. And then, morality is a matter of promoting that good. That pre-moral, non-moral, amoral good. Morality comes on the scene late. And what I'm suggesting to you now is that that's a problem. That we don't think that we can identify what's good, what's objectively valuable, in non-moral terms. We don't think that the satisfaction of any desire, whatever the content, is good. So, uh, I guess, uh, sorry, uh, I'll stop um, and we'll give a name, we'll give names to these two different approaches on Friday and then we'll start talking about this.